pleased to be sharing with you the status of biobanking in Philippine health research. As a backgrounder, I am a member of the UP Manila Research Ethics Board. So um, we have access to data on uh, protocols that have biobanking components. So that's why I would like to share with you uh, the information about biobanks or protocols involving biobanking and use of biobank samples from the last five years. So um, the University of the Philippines Manila is the health sciences unit of the University of the Philippines system. So there are two campuses of the University of the Philippines in the city or in the capital. So one is in Quezon City where Michael belongs to, that's in Diliman, and the other campus is in Manila. So the UP Manila campus houses the Philippine General Hospital. It's one of the largest tertiary hospitals in the country, and Michael has already mentioned that the Philippine General Hospital has just recently established its uh, biobank. So uh, the College of Medicine, or the only College of Medicine of the University of the Philippines system is also found in the University of the Philippines, Manila. We also have colleges uh, on public health, allied medical professions, nursing, so uh, you can see that in UP Manila, the researches would mainly be biomedical or researches involving, med uh, involving human participants. So UP Manila also has one of the largest research ethics board in the country. One of the largest and one of the first uh, fair cap accredited research ethics board in the country. Our research ethics board has been established in 2011. We are uh, per cap uh, recognized, level three per cap recognized, and also accredited by FREB, or the Philippine Health Research Ethics Board. FREB is the national accreditation body for research ethics committee. So the UPM REV reviews around 500 new protocols every year. So that's only the new protocols that we review every year, around 500. And there are six review panels, two panels for clinical trials, faculty research, and graduate student research. We have two panels for PGH trainees. These would include the residents and the fellows and other employees of the Philippine General Hospital who would have health research. And we all also have two review panels for undergraduate research. So in this talk, I will basically discuss the history of the National Ethical Guidelines on Health Research in the context of biobanking and present to you our data or research protocols with biobanking component. So the Philippines has a national ethical uh, guideline, so we also have a law the Philippine National Health Research System. Uh, that law subsumes the Philippine Health Research Ethics Board or the FREB. So the FREB uh, gives accreditation for all the ethics committees in the country. And the first national ethical guidelines by FREB was published in 2011. And this, guide, this set of guidelines has been revised and uh, there are several addenda already to the original guidelines. So the next version of the guidelines came out in 2017. So, but the main difference between these two guidelines is the first set of guidelines is silent about uh, protocols involving biobanking or biobanks. So as just a history of uh, uh, for biobanking studies in the Philippines. So prior to the 9th, 2017 guidelines, there was no national guideline on use of samples from biobanks and data from human biobanks and uh, uh, research databases. So, uh, so before, the existing health research ethics do not add, are, were not adequate to mediate existing research relationships. So in uh, the National Ethical Guidelines for Health and Health-Related Research 2017, a section on biobanks already added, and I was 
one of the uh, authors of the section on dialects. Okay. So prior to 2017, uh, when we encounter protocols in the Research Ethics Board, protocols that involve biobanks or uh, databases, we just refer to OECD guidelines, to OECD 2009 guidelines, because the OECD 2009 guidelines provide uh, guidelines on the structure and governance for biobanks, informed consent related to biobanks and use of archival samples, as well as access to biobanks and archival samples. We also refer to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality 2014 edition, uh, which includes the uh, policies or guidelines for registries for evaluating patient outcomes. So we refer to these uh, uh, guidelines prior to the NEGHHR 2017. Of course, we also refer to CEOM's guideline 2014 because the National Ethical Guidelines for Health Research in 2011, just as this single statement referencing to biobanking and use of archival samples, it, there's just one statement stating it is required that all secondary and third party uses of biological samples are restricted to anonymized or anonymous samples as above and both still need ethical approval for use and limited not identifying demographic information may be retained on the sample. So that's the only statement in the previous guideline. But in the current guideline, in the NEGHHR 2017, we already have a section on research using biobanks, registries, and databases. So the section contains the policies that require state that require protocols to state the purpose of the biobank, the protocols uh, state governance and custodianship of the biobank, guidelines on data privacy, because the Philippines uh, already has a Data Privacy Act that was uh, approved in 2012, and the IRR of the Data Privacy Act came out in 2014. So the uh, Guidelines also deals with uh, policies on informed consent and collection and storage of biological samples and information and access. Okay. So going back to the UP Manila Research Ethics Board data, so for the data that I will be presenting to you this morning, we have reviewed 2,296 protocols from the last five years. Okay. So we check, uh, of course, we determined the number of protocols with biobanking component. Uh, our question was, is there really a lot of studies in the Philippines um, with biobanking components or using biobank or archive samples? We also checked if the studies with biobanking components involve vulnerable populations because in the, the Philippines is a favorite clinical trial uh, country uh, both for adults and children. Okay. So um, we also check if the consent in the protocols for biobanking is specific. Okay. What are the different types of materials biobank? What is the usual proposed number of years for biobanking? Where are the biobanks located? And are study results disclosed? Will there be return of results? And what institutions so far have human tissue biobanks? So as regards the types of studies with biobanking components or using biobank samples, it would still be the clinical trial type 1. Clinical trial type 1, as we have classified it, would be the clinical trials um, that are for drugs meant to be marketed. And when we say clinical trial type 2, these are clinical trials for drugs that are not meant to be commercialized. So it's still the clinical trials that would have the most of our protocols of biobanking components would be from the clinical trials. But other protocols that would have biobanking component would be genetic or genomic researches, which takes up uh, also a large chunk of the protocols. Also, we have post-marketing surveillance studies that uh, has biobanking component, diagnostic studies, 
and uh, diagnostic studies uh, with genetic or genomic research and other non-clinical trials such as review of medical records. So for a year, we have seen that it's still from 2014 to 2018, the clinical trials would still dominate the protocols that would have biobanking as component and followed by the studies involving genetic or genomic research, which, is, which are these studies here. Now, what are the different populations or vulnerable groups in protocols with biobanking? So we see here a large chunk from children. 32% of the protocols would involve children because in the Philippines, we have a lot of vaccine clinical trials. And um, many of these clinical trials have biobanking components. As for the types of informed consent, so we check if the informed consent contains specific provisions for biobanking or just a broad uh, consent. Most of the studies would have broad consent. And when we say, or when I say broad consent, that is the, the consent will just uh, ask for consent for future research. So the protocol is just asking for biobanking of the sample broadly for future research. Early on, that was the usual consent, but from 2014 onwards, a little, uh, the protocols became a little more specific. The protocols would already state for future genetic research or for future uh, specific disease research, for future diabetic research, uh, or for future cancer research. As regards the types of tissues bank, it will still be whole blood that will uh, that is mostly banked in the Philippines, followed by DNA extracted from blood. Then we also have here uh, nasopharyngeal swabs, 30. We have nasopharyngeal swabs and urine, two more tissues. And we, we have separated uh, blood serum and blood plasma from the whole blood in terms of being biobank. And we also see here a number of protocols with RNA uh, banked. And the other uh, tissues that are banked, tissues or Genetic material with this tool and two more DNA. Uh, you have DNA and bone marrow tissue. There's also hair and cerebrospinal fluid. So these are the tissues that are back back. What about the duration, the proposed duration, or the number of years uh, the samples are buying back? Most of the studies have 15 to 20 years of biobank of proposed biobanking. Why only 15 to 20 years? There are no, there's, as you know, there's no national biobank in the Philippines. The biobanks are institutional or they are hosted by certain, by some professional societies. So this has something to do with the capacity of the institution to uh, maintain the biobank. So most of the studies are 15 to 20 years of biobank in the sample. It's also amusing because some studies propose 15 to 20 years uh, for biobanking because in 15 to 20 years, the uh, curator or the PI will retire. <laughs> so they, are, they just want to maintain the biobank until the curator or the principal investigator retires. Now, as regards location of the biobanks, from 2014 to 2018, most of the samples collected in the Philippines for health research are back in foreign institutions. Because as we have seen er er earlier, most of the studies with biobanking component are clinical trials, and these are sponsored uh, trials. So most so they will get, uh, aside from the interventional study, they will get blood samples, whole blood samples, that they will send to the central facility uh, for future genetic or genomic research. But since 2014, there have been local biobanks uh, also. How about the provision for results disclosure? 
are Philippine health uh, researchers with biobanking components uh, providing results to the patients or to the subjects. For clinical, uh, so here, no is red, yes is blue. So for clinical trials, type 1, these are the uh, usual big drug trials. Uh, return of results, uh, the return of results is not provided. So in the consent, it is uh, stated that uh, whatever happens to the sample that we get from you, you will not be notified. But in health uh, research ethics, as you know, if the individual gives consent to that uh, statement, then uh, that's already uh, valid and that will be acceptable already. So for non-clinical trials, uh, uh, there will, for non-clinical trials, such as genetic or genomic research, uh, uh, if they are more um, aware of the value of returning the results or providing the results, because many genetic or genomic research in the Philippines provide uh, genetic counseling. They provide genetic counseling. I'm very proud of that, that in the Philippines, most of the genetic or genomic researches involving human participants provide genetic counseling as benefit for the participants. So that gives them a chance to explain the result or, or if there are incidental findings, that is the, the chance the patients would have. But um, for clinical trial type 2 is almost the same. Some would provide results, some do not. For post-marketing surveillance, they do not provide results. These are post-marketing surveillance of vaccine studies. So after the vaccine is commercialized, and it is already, if the vaccine is already marketed in the Philippines, there will be post-marketing surveillance studies, and they will still get blood or other body fluids from the population to monitor uh, biomarkers. So in summary, uh, there is just a very small proportion of new health research protocols that have biobanking components through the years. So that this uh, tells us that up to date, there is really, perhaps there is really no need for a national biobank uh, for the Philippines. So because it's very small, less than 5%. And most of the protocols are clinical trials followed by genetic or genomic researches. The samples obtained are from non-vulnerable non -vulnerable populations, so mainly adults, but there are also protocols that would uh, involve children. The consent for biobanking in most of the studies is brought just for future research. Blood, or rather whole blood, is the most common tissue bank. The storage is 15 to 20 years, and the biobank location is mostly in foreign institutions. Study results disclosure is unusual for most of the studies except for the genetic or the genomic studies. So, so far, the issues or the ethical issues that have been associated with protocols involving biobanking is the use of the samples or the data from biobanks, registries, and databases prior to the National Ethical Guidelines of 2011. We are still receiving protocols in the Ethics Committee for use of biobank samples that have no consent, but have been anonymized already. So these were samples. Uh, some were collected in 2000, 2004, 2005, and we didn't have a national ethical guidelines yet by then. But these are all anonymized samples. Uh, whole blood or serum that would just have codes. So the ethics committee still has to deal with these types of protocols. Another issue is the secondary or the use of the sample or the data obtained with uh, broad consent. Because uh, as I said earlier, most of the biobanks are institutional. And so, for example, if UP Manila has a biobank at the College of Public Health, and another investigator from another college wants to uh, have access 
to, uh, to the samples of the College of Public Health, then we have to check the consent uh, obtained for biobanking the samples at the College of Public Health. Can, it, can other parties have access to these samples? Or are these samples open for access to other parties or to other researchers in the Philippines? Uh, vulnerability is another issue because as I've said, there are also post-marketing surveillance for uh, uh, vaccine trials. Disclosure of study results has been well explained by uh, the first speaker this morning and custodian and governance. This is now the main issue we are facing because since the National Ethical Guidelines of 2017 came out, so many institutions and investigators submitting their protocols are stating, oh, we would like to, well, to buy back uh, the samples that we will collect for this study. And so, if they say that, the ethics committee will ask, what is now the custodianship and governance structure of your uh, institution? Because you cannot, as we have learned, you cannot just buy back samples. That was the governance structure should be in place first before you start uh, biobanking the samples. And the duration of storage and the access to the biobank are still issues that we contend with uh, in terms of health research protocols. So there are very few uh, biobanks in the Philippines today. Uh, I think one of the uh, bigger biobanks would be the, uh, that of the Newborn Screening Reference Center since the newborn screening uh, also is a law in the Philippines so they have a biobank, uh, a blood biobank. Um, and uh, we also have the Institute of Human Genetics at the University of the Philippines Manila National Institutes of Health that have their uh, tissue as well as nucleic acid biobanks. Also the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology of UP Manila National Institutes of Health, the Parasitology Department of the College of Public Health in UP Manila, St. Luke's Medical Center also has a biobank, the Oncology Society of the Philippines also has a biobank, and as Dr. Velarde mentioned earlier, the Philippine General Hospital Biobank has just been established. So that's the status of biobanking uh, in the Philippines. I think uh, this uh, information will be very valuable to us Filipinos in moving forward uh, in terms of uh, um, establishing institutional biobanks, if not a national biobank. So thank you very much.